Good morning, brothers and sisters. So recently I asked for prayer regarding the injury to my wrist while playing baseball with my kids this past weekend. First of all, I just want to thank everybody out there for uh, all the comments and prayers. I can definitely sense your prayers. And uh, as of now, I'm just continuing to trust the Lord for healing on my wrist so I can continue to work. And so this has been a real trial for me of trusting the Lord. One of the things I wanted to share with you today that I hope blesses you is the Lord led me to read this little booklet um, that's been sitting on my nightstand, something my wife ordered from uh, David Jeremiah. And the Lord led me to open up to this exact page. And uh, as I began reading it, I knew exactly what it was talking about because the Lord was speaking to me through it. So I'm going to read that for you here. And uh, I think you'll find it fitting. And I hope it's a blessing to you. So the title is The Purpose of the Disruptive Moment. Lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of revelations. Paul clearly states that the purpose of his suffering was to protect him from the sin of pride. In the preceding verses, Paul described a time in the past when he had been granted an opportunity to be caught up into the very heavens with God. Now that's certainly a remarkable opportunity. Such an experience had been granted to no other person, and Paul could easily have been filled with pride over his unique privilege. If Paul had a press agent, he would have most certainly billed Paul as the only man who had visited heaven and lived to tell about it. But God uses disruptive moments to help us keep things in perspective. The Pain of the Disruptive Moment a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan, to buffet me. Scholars have spent untold hours speculating on the nature of Paul's problem. What was the affliction he was referring to? Some have suggested that Paul had developed eye problems, since we know that he began to dictate his letters to others. Another theory is that Paul was suffering from epileptic seizures. Sir William Ramsey even suggested that Paul had some reoccurring strain of malaria. You could fill a medical encyclopedia with other ideas that have been advanced. Don't forget that Paul had persecuted and tortured many Christians prior to his conversion. Although we can't be sure about Paul's thorn, we can say this. The word used for thorn carries the literal meaning of stake. So what Paul wants to suggest to us is that he had a stake driven into his flesh. Quite a disruptive moment, wouldn't you agree? If we'd been told the exact nature of his affliction, this passage might have just seemed to be a story about Paul. We wouldn't be able to fill in the blank with our own personal afflictions, and our own thorns might seem outside the reach of God's grace. Instead, we're invited by 2 Corinthians 12, 7-10 to identify with Paul's suffering. We're given the opportunity to realize that if God's grace was sufficient for him, whatever the nature of his suffering, it is sufficient for us as well. Therefore, as strange as it may sound, we can find encouragement even in our most disruptive moments. The provision in the disruptive moment. My grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Verse 9. There's the focus word for this chapter, sufficient. Without a doubt, being in a position of insufficiency is incredibly discouraging. Nobody likes to be burdened with not enough. Not enough time, not enough money, not enough experience, not enough strength. The good news is that we serve a God who has never been not enough. Instead, he is always sufficient. Paul didn't relish painful experiences any more than you or I do. In fact, he asked God three times to remove the thorn from his flesh, but God refused his request. He would not remove the thorn, but he would do something else. In the midst of the ordeal, he would give Paul all the grace he needed to continue his work. He also told Paul that his strength would be made perfect in this time of weakness. Think of that, strength enshrined in weakness, power in pain. It completely defies and undermines the human approach to things. 
And that's why it glorifies God. The product of the disruptive moment. That the power of Christ may rest upon me. For when I am weak, then I am strong. What God told Paul was merely this. You won't lack the grace to do your job. You won't lack the strength to be my ambassador. But the creative difference will be this. Your weakness will serve to magnify the glory of my power in such a way that no one will ever again be able to explain your experience in human terms. The weaker we are, the stronger His grace is revealed. Or to put it another way, when this little light of mine becomes dimmer, His great floodlight shines all the more brightly. The Perspective of the Disruptive Moment Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. What a perspective. Paul sees himself in the midst of this disruptive moment and says, I am not the man I used to be. I've suffered and I've felt my share of pain. Yet now I find within myself an inner depth, a spiritual dynamic I've never known before. I've entered into the deepest mystery of life the fellowship of Christ's sufferings. And now that I see the meaning of it all, I wouldn't trade a moment of misery for pure gold. In the end, you see, our pain offers us far greater wealth. I've had a thorn in my flesh, and I claim it as a badge of honor. So the Apostle Paul has told us all about his weakness. Was he simply a passive person? Don't even consider it. The briefest study of his life demonstrates that there was nothing passive about Paul. This was the man who had scoured the countryside in search of Christians to intimidate. This was the man who had successfully debated the apostles on the question of Gentile salvation. This was the man who had faced stonings and beatings for the sake of the gospel. Paul chose the most hostile settings in which to preach the gospel and plant churches. He scattered seeds of the gospel throughout Asia Minor and along the Aegean Sea. As the seeds grew, he trained the first pastors and elders in all the new churches. And then, in his spare time, he wrote half the New Testament. So please do not call him passive. Paul was a mover and a shaker. How then do we reconcile this with his claim to weakness? How can a man be both weak and strong? The answer lies in the phrase, When I am weak, then I am strong. That statement bears careful scrutiny. Listen well to Charles Stanley's eloquent paraphrase. When I, Paul, in and of my own strength, am weak, then I, Paul, relying on the power of Christ in me, become strong, capable of whatever the Lord requires of me, full of energy and zeal to accomplish His will. Do not lose sight of this critical truth. As we've already seen, you will face discouragement in your life. You will travel your own bends in the road. You may even endure seasons when you feel too weak to go on, when you don't have the strength to make it through. Even so, don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. Why? Because God does have the strength, and His grace is sufficient for you always. I pray that was a blessing to you, brothers and sisters, and I pray the Lord speaks to you through this. God bless.